Hi and welcome back to the Peregrine Dame. This time, I'm in Belize. Hi, I'm Rachel Parsons and I travel alone. All over the world. The Notre showed you. The traveling solo doesn't have to be so scary. And then traveling alone doesn't mean you're lonely. So don't wait for somebody to come with you. The world is not going to wait for you. Yeah. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Yeah. Be a peregrine dame. Be a peregrine dame. in fourth grade, my class did reports on native Central Americans. The Mayans grabbed my attention like no other, so I've come to Belize alone in order to explore that civilization. But first, I'm spending a few days in Belize City. I've chosen intentionally to stay out of the tourist trap that is the Fort George tourist village where most of the hotels are located. Instead, I'm staying in a boutique inn in a regular neighborhood on the north side of Hollover Creek. The street that the Bacadir Inn sits on is not pretty. But don't be deceived, the hotel is lovely, it's got tight security, and the staff are really sweet people. <laughs> it's green. It's bright green. I will not have any problem waking up in the morning here. This is great. <laughs> wow, it's bright but it's pretty. And the best part is, for my money, it's the best deal in Belize City because for this price range, under $50 US, for a private room with a bathroom, a private bathroom, and air conditioning, it really is one of the best deals you're gonna find. <laughs> it's green. <laughs> okay, I won't complain. It's Belize, it's very hot, and it's very humid, and I have an air conditioner in my room for the price of the room, that's really good. But that's a really loud air conditioner. <laughs> Although at the moment, it's just loud enough to drown out the huge amount of bass I hear coming from the next door neighbors. Don't blame them for partying though. It is a day off. It's Sunday, which means in Belize, in Belize City, nothing is open. And when I say nothing, I mean nothing on Sundays. You cannot find a restaurant that's open. So thankfully, what are out are street vendors. I ended up with a huge box of red beans and rice, stewed marinated chicken, which is amazing, potato salad, and fried plantains, all of which is standard Belizean home cooking. And it cost me about $4 US, and I'll be able to save it for a second meal. In fact, I eat the rest for breakfast the next morning, because I have a feeling I'm going to need all my strength. Every September, Belize celebrates its independence with a month's worth of festivities they call the September Celebrations. This year marks 31 years of independence from British rule and the 214th anniversary of St. George's Key Day. I've arrived just in time for the celebration, the ceremony, the parade, and the party. The day-long party starts with a ceremony at Memorial Park in the gentrified colonial Fort George neighborhood. The Battle of St. George's Key was a decisive moment in the founding of British Honduras when a small group of British baymen and their African slaves helped successfully defend the region against invaders from Mexico eager to assert Spanish claims. The crowd comes out for the speeches, the contest of songs commemorating the battle, and the annual pageant crowning the Queen of the Bay. The shindig is attended by dignitaries and the Governor General of Belize. I've never been so close to a head of state before, but the ceremony is just the warm-up act. The population of Belize City is somewhere around 85,000 people, and most of the city comes out for the festivities. It's hard to miss the fact that in a town with bus and boatloads of tourists transferring through, I'm the only obvious traveler here with the locals. One third of the population of the country of Belize lives below the poverty line, and there are only 300,000 people total in the country. The average salary is under 300 US dollars a month here. So poverty does breed crime. That being said, the cruise ships and the high-end hotels do a very good job of scaring the tourists 
away from traveling or walking or spending time experiencing the city center here. Watch who you're talking to, watch who, where you're going with someone, you know, it's kind of dangerous. I understand that there's a reason that the guidebooks and the tour guides and the hotels and the cruise ships warn the tourists to be careful here and not to talk to anybody, not to talk to strangers, not to do this. But on some level, at some point, you have to interact with the culture you've come to visit. I think it's kind of sad that all of these people have been, they've been conditioned to think we're all afraid of them and we've been conditioned to be afraid of them, regardless of if it's founded or not. But I don't dwell on it for too long. There's more fun to be had. St. George's Key Day culminates in a huge outdoor party. I cruise over and I'm promptly adopted by a group of friends who see that I'm alone. They even school me in the culinary vernacular. Oh, like get a Those are actually just banana chips. Belizean musicians such as Punta Rock legend Chico Ramos play well into the night. Again, I'm the only person who's obviously from out of town here celebrating with these people. And I'm so happy to experience the holiday with everyone. This is what Belizean culture is all about. These people are fiercely proud of their interracial heritage, their collective cultures, and most importantly, in the month of September, their democratic independence. What? The other tourists are clearly missing out, but it's their loss. I've come to Belize, the little Central American country that feels a lot like a Caribbean island. I want to check out some of the ancient Mayan ruins here, but I'm spending a few days in Belize City first, which everyone and their brother has told me is very dangerous. Every guidebook I've read and two-thirds of the locals have told me how dangerous it is. And I'm sure they're right. I mean, you, when locals tell you something or other about their city, when more than one or two people say it, you have to listen. The people have been fantastic. But there's no getting around that a higher poverty rate means there's a higher crime rate. The guidebook Lonely Planet does a really good job of laying out where travelers should and should not be. Most of the time, it's a given rule that at night, take a cab. Doesn't matter where you are in the city center. Just do it. If you see a deserted street, don't walk down it. Some things are just common sense. Many of the cab drivers in Belize City also work as local guides. They're licensed and knowledgeable, and the fees are reasonable. So I've decided to go on a short private tour. For me, spending time with a local is worth it. How long have you been driving in Belize? No, I'm driving in Belize from I was 18 years old. I'm 56 years old now. So that's a lot, of, over 30, 30 something years. That's a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> the town is compact, and it's easy to see all of the highlights in a couple of hours like the Baron Bliss Lighthouse with the grave of the Baron, who left two million dollars to British Honduras upon his death in 1926 without ever having stepped foot on the mainland. I wish somebody who never met me gave me two million dollars. St. John's Cathedral is 200 years old. It's made of bricks from Britain brought over as ballasts on the slave ships. So basically, when you got your slaves off your ship, they unloaded your bricks, and then they built your church. All of the wood in here is mahogany. The pews, the columns, the altar. It's just amazing. The British drained most of Belize of its mahogany, and they've slowly started replanting. A mahogany tree takes 60 to 80 years to get big enough to harvest, and right now their first crop is about 20 years old. I like Emmanuel's tour so much, I decide to force him to wake up at 5 in the morning the next day to take me to Altunha. Car rentals in Belize can be pretty pricey. So your options from Belize City going out to Altunha are either big coaches, big buses that run from the tourist areas out here, where you're herded onto like a bunch of cattle with everybody else, or you've got private taxis and drivers, which I have chosen today. My trusty guide and driver, Emmanuel, is bringing me out for about $25 each way and for a private ride for about an hour long trip that's a really good price. 
Located 31 miles north of Belize City, Altunha was a significant Mayan trading center. The earliest evidence of settlement here dates back 2200 years. I've beaten the crowd and have the place all to myself, so I rustle up a guide and get a special surprise. This piece here was found by a guy whose name is Benjamin Adenet. He's my great grandfather. He's the one that takes a piece of jade pendant to the government of Belize. Leroy Wallace is part of a long legacy. His father was a guide here before him, and he grew up with this site as his backyard. Then the government of Belize take it to the Ontario Museum in Canada. Then come Mr. Pendergast, come and stop everyone from using rock from this site. Dr. David Pendergast was the field director for the Royal Ontario Museum's excavation of Altunha in the early 1960s. So locals were just dragging yeah. rocks off this site. They not think it was a quarry. Was. They think it was a quarry. They used to use the rock for build foundation for their home. And also the government of Belize also used to buy rock from these village people to fix that old northern highway that you've been on. At its peak, Altunha was home to 10 to 12,000 people. The site comprises hundreds of structures, but only the two plazas and the reservoir are open to the public. And this is Plaza A. This is where they do their trading. Because here in Belize, we do not have jade. Jade come from the Ontario Valley in Guatemala. What we have here that the Mayans used to trade will be stone like these right here. These are flint stone. Now, flint were so important in those days because you need flint to start fire. Jade do not come from Belize, so that is what they used to trade. And boy, did they. Plaza A is home to the temple that held what is now known as the Green Tomb. More than 300 artifacts, many of them jade, were discovered in the tomb. But there's something interesting that was not discovered here. Whenever you go to a Mayan site and there is no ball court, that means they didn't used to do sacrifice. So no sacrifice of human taking place at this site. Probably animals and different stuff. So what does the ball game have to do with it? A, a ball game is the winner gets sacrificed while the loser play tomorrow. But it's not the whole team gets sacrificed, it's only one somebody, the captain from that team. Ooh, so yeah. nobody wants to win. <laughs> nobody wants to win. Dang. That's, That's actually not true. They didn't scare of that. They feel like it was something good. It's not like us today. Right. That is scared of death. So the captain who won the game wouldn't care because no. he was, he was yeah, ready to go? Yeah, because you're going to another world, life after death. And at least some of these Mayans would get to the next world looking pretty strange, by our standards anyway. Now, if you notice on the forehead, it's very flat. That also used to be their beauty and their cross eyes, like a jaguar looking straight at you. So yeah. that was the... The cultural beauty, yeah, the for beauty the elites, standard. For the elites, that used to be Flat beautiful. Flat foreheads and crossed eyes. That's right, yeah. No, the way how they get their head flat after they give birth, they will get a stone or a board, put it on the baby head, so it can go flat like that. And also the cross eye, they will get a bead with a string, put it on the on the nose bridge right here, and make the baby continue look at, on that bead. And that is how they get their eyes crossed. Some of their other aesthetic taste can still be seen on the mask as well. We got paint from 200 BC. You see red paint right there? That's 200. red paint. And this is red paint. Wait, wait. Yeah. 200 BC to 580. So that paint could be 2200 years That's old. That's right. Construction of most of the large structures began around the first century of the Common Era. Excavators also know exactly where the whole thing started. This pond was where Mayans quarried the stone to build Altunha. They also unearthed a natural spring. Yeah, so they found an everlasting spring underneath it. And they case around with yellow clay so the water can stay in this pond. And from that time, this pond never had been dry. If we could remove the water, we might still be able to see the step terraces ringing the pit. When the Peregrine Dame returns, I channel my inner high priest. With only rudimentary knowledge of the Mayan civilization, I've come to Altunha, an archaeological site north of Belize City. I'm curious about the name of the place. We didn't know what is the original name for Altunha. That is only a name that Mr. Pendergast gave to the site because of what he found around here. A lot of rock and a lot of pond. So he called it rock stone water. 
The city known as Rockstone Water, or Altunha, was an important trading hub within the Mundo Mayan. Mundo Mayan means Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and Belize, five countries that the Mayans they used to live. In its heyday, the city was home to 10 to 12,000 people. 3,000 would be the elites that will stay on this side. Those are the ones that tell you when it's going to rain, look in the skies and know when the sun is coming out, stuff like that, when it's going to be an eclipse and stuff like that. The Temple of the Masonry Altar in Plaza B, or Temple B4, was where much of the spiritual ritual took place. It used to be much taller than that, but Mr. Pendergast destroyed like two different construction pieces when he were looking for the tomb for the top there. Dr. Pendergast nearly didn't find that tomb. He was ready to fill the top back in when a local working on his excavation knocked through a floor and discovered the largest carved jade artifact in the Mayan world, the jade head. If it wasn't sick of that guy, we will never find that jade head. Come Mr. Pendergast were looking to cover everything back. The structure of priesthood varies from one region to the next. But largely, there was a high priest in each city that acted as intermediary between the people and the deities. And many of the rituals were based on the priest's study of the celestial skies. So he will tell the rest of Mayans, bring your jade, your pottery, and all of your stuff, because I will, if you don't honor me, I will take away the sun from you. Because they were educated, especially in astronomy, they were in a unique position to extort riches from the populace by fear. Right. I'll make the gloves go away. Give me everything you own. That's what they said, right? That's right. Turns out Leroy doesn't have any jade. And this is my cue to leave. This trip today, if I had come to Belize for nothing else, this has been worth it. This is just incredible. But now it's time to get out of the heat and head for the beach. I've decided to spend my last days in Belize on Key Cocker, an island in the chain of keys to the northeast of Belize City. It's an easy 45-minute ride. In the 1600s, Key Cocker was popular with British buccaneers as a spot to stop and work on their ships. It was eventually settled as a fishing village and still is today, although tourism has taken the lead as the dominant industry here. The sleepy fishing village became a hot spot on the backpackers' tour through Central America in the 1960s. And of all the northern keys in Belize, it's remained largely untouched by commercial development. I check into Yuma's, a hostel that's still uber popular with the backpacking crowd. Yuma's is really cute. It's right on the water too, which means even if it wasn't cute, it would still be worth it. My room's costing me about $25 US a night for a private room right on the beach, just steps from the water taxi stand, so it's a great deal. I'm here in the off season. So the upshot is there are far, 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 far fewer tourists than there would be in the winter time here. But the downside is that there are a few things that just shut down as far as bars and restaurants. You get to choose more dining options or fewer people. I hear this place has the best coffee on the island, so it's time for breakfast. Amori Cafe is run by Mika, a European expat who's a sweetheart. The coffee is wonderful, the staff is great, and it's also a perfect perch to watch part of the island's September celebrations. All the school children on Key Cocker celebrate Independence Day a week before the actual adult carnival. And like the adults, they have a pageant with a king and queen from each age range, each grade, and a big parade. The village on Key Calker is about a mile long, so it's easy to get to know all of it, and there are plenty of watering holes along the way, like 88 West, which is adjacent to Belize Diving Services. One of those has my name on it. All right, well, I'll cheers you with the. This. The cute boy buying the shots is named TJ. <laughs> yeah. And warm too. And this turns into this. And this and this and this. What? Which means frankly, I'm in no shape to do this the next day. Coming to Key Calker and not getting out on the water is like going to Paris and not climbing the Eiffel Tower. So I'm spending my last afternoon here on the island with the boys from Belize Diving Services. TJ works for Belize Diving Services. 
I'm going snorkeling this afternoon since I don't know how to dive. I'm not certified, but either way, it doesn't matter if you just come out and dip your toes in the water. You still need to get off the land when you're here to really appreciate the views. BDS is a full-service dive shop and school. The expert staff is very professional and they love what they do. Our skipper today, Cal, has been with the company for 12 years. Cal, what kind of shark is it? Those are nurse sharks. Nurse sharks and stingrays are just a couple of the neighbors in one of the world's greatest diving regions. We're not too far from the Blue Hole. I've never been so close to a shark before. And I mean, it's a nurse shark. It's not gonna hurt me, but it's still pretty intense when I get close enough to you. They won't hurt me, but my goggles are telling TJ I'm in trouble. If your head's out of the water and your goggles on top of your head, it means you're a diver in distress, you're panicking. Okay. Maybe you're out of breath or you're in distress in some way, right? And that, in a nutshell, is Belize. So cool. To see extra scenes and outtakes, head on over to theperegrinedame.com.